Hello, this is Dr. James Strickler, and this lecture is for Chapter 12, Manifest Destiny, in the United States History Textbook, American Yop. The first topic in this chapter is American Exceptionalism. This is the idea that America, as a nation, is exceptional or different from other countries in world history, that America holds a unique place as we talk about the history of the world. This idea of American exceptionalism can be traced back to the Jeffersonian ideal of the American Republic. Thomas Jefferson saw the United States as, in its best future, a country of yeoman farmers. Now, what was meant by this was that the United States would be a nation of individual landholders. People would have their own land that they could make their own living off of to be economically independent in a sense from each other. But this economic independence would make them politically equal with each other. Remember that in the centuries leading up to the American Revolution and for quite some time after, that land equaled power. This has been discussed before in this course. And what this meant in America was that if you spread out a land, the land among the people, then you would spread out power among the people and contribute to this idea of republicanism, that the power of government is derived from the people through their representatives. This was the great American ideal that was put forward by Jefferson and his followers. But to see this idea come to fruition, as you've already seen stated, land was needed. Now, fortunately, after the American Revolution, there was an abundance of land. Well, at least theoretically. The reason for this was as part of the settlement of the American Revolution, Great Britain conceded all lands up to the Mississippi River to the fledgling United States. Each state claimed some of those lands. But rather than try to settle those lands themselves, over a 20 year period, they all ceded those lands to the United States to organize into a territories and future states. Part of this organization came in 1787 when the 13 original states were still trying to cooperate under the Articles of Confederation. Now, you remember from previous discussion that one of the big problems of the Articles of Confederation was that unanimous agreement was required among the states to do anything. Well, at least in this case, they were able to unanimously agree to organize the Northwest Territories. Now, this is, these are the territories that covered what would eventually become Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and parts of Minnesota. They organized these for rapid settlement, dividing them up to form towns and individual land plots for settlers to come and buy. This was one of the great accomplishments under the Articles of Confederation. Well, additional land was provided for eventual settlement by the Louisiana Purchase, done in 1803 by Thomas Jefferson. Now remember what happened here was uh, France had claimed these lands early on during the uh, European powers coming and settling in North America, but then they had lost them in a war with Spain. But then what happened was Napoleon came to power in France, defeated the Spanish and regained those lands. But he needed to pay off some of the debt of fighting the war with Spain. So he sold them to the United States. Thomas Jefferson negotiated the deal and bought the lands, um, even though he questioned whether it was really constitutional for him to do so. Nonetheless, this provided another big swath of land to potentially be settled by these growing numbers of yeoman farmers from the idyllic view of Thomas Jefferson of a republic of farmers. President Jefferson wanted to know what he had purchased in this territory of Louisiana. So he organized an expedition led by two men, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, who set out from St. Louis across this unknown land, eventually making their way all the way to the Pacific Ocean in what would eventually become the state of Oregon. They were helped along in this expedition by a Native American woman who translated for them. 
she has become known in history as Sacagawea. In addition to exploring these new lands for settlement, there was also moves made to provide transportation to get people there. A great example of this was the National Road that was built in the year 1811. This was a um, wagon road that could transport people from Maryland all the way to Illinois. Later on, railroads would be added too. These internal improvements, roads, canals, railroads, were either directly sponsored or subsidized by the government in order to enable settlers to cross the Appalachian Mountains and settle in these new open territories to the west so that they could all become land owning farmers like the ideal that we've talked about. This then became a general theme in the United States in the mid 1800s that people should move west. The newspaper publisher Horace Greeley who would later become a presidential candidate, was a big advocate of this. He saw the eastern cities crowded with immigrants and people working for low wages in factories as unhealthy, and he thought people should move west for a better life. Some people thought that this was a particular destiny for America, that America is one of the young countries in the world, led by young, ambitious people, should become a leading figure in the world by expanding and becoming more powerful, such as that suggested here by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said that in every age of humanity, there's some leading country. Well, why not us, the young Americans? Why can't we become the greatest nation on earth? Eventually, this idea of moving west and into greatness was given the name Manifest Destiny. This came from a column written by a man named John Lewis O'Sullivan in 1845. And this embodied the idea that this was American destiny for us to spread across the country, excuse me, across the continent and bring the ideals of our country with us. Manifest destiny then became the ideal of this age, of an ever growing country of a country filled with a vitality of youth and a feeling of its own greatness that it would eventually grow into and that it would grow into it by moving west. And what would it bring with it? Well, it would bring with it the American exceptionalism, these things that made us different than other countries around the world and in many people's minds better. Our embracing of capitalism, this driving economic force that produced wealth and vitality and our embracing of the, the ideal of democracy, that every citizen should be participating in government equally. These were ideals that were not commonly believed around the world, but and America thought that it was its great purpose to spread these ideals to the rest of the world, even if that meant, to begin with, stretching our country across the continent and clearing anybody out of the way that might be stand between us and that destiny. Among those that might stand in the way were the Native Americans. And as we've already alluded to before in previous chapters, they were removed. An early example of this came at the end of the War of 1812. Now remember the War of 1812 was fought between the United States and Great Britain. And during the war, Spain tried to take advantage of the situation by inviting free, black, excuse me, blacks who were enslaved in the southern United States to escape to freedom to in Florida. Now, what happened was the British, late in the war, established a fort in Florida just over the border from Georgia. And that fort ended up eventually being occupied by these escaped slaves. And in 1860, U.S. troops invaded to do away with this uh, outpost of free blacks right on the border with Georgia. A powder magazine in the fort was ac accidentally ignited, blowing up the fort and killing everybody within it. That battle of the Negro Fort was just the first example of an ongoing campaign by the United States within the borders of Florida. 
We talked about this before when we discussed the uh, political growth of Andrew Jackson, how we went from a popular soldier eventually to President of the United States. He gained some of his early fa fame by participating in the First Seminole War, where he led raids over the border between the United States into Florida. And this was claimed to be, to, to be justified by Seminoles raiding the other direction. This invasion of U.S. troops under Andrew Jackson into Florida eventually led to Spain deciding that they could not maintain Florida. Since they thought the United States would eventually take Florida from them anyway, they negotiated a treaty, the adams onis Treaty, which in 1819 ceded Florida to the United States of America. Well, once the United States had possession of Florida, they still had to take care of the inhabitants there that were not happy about United States rule. Now, remember, we've talked about this before. The Spanish invited blacks to come to Florida and would grant them freedom. Well, these free blacks then, um, as I already said, were considered a problem for the slave owning South. They didn't want the symbol of freedom right next to them or now within them since the Florida had been taken over by the United States. This led to the Second Seminole War, which was supposedly a war against rebellious Native Americans who didn't want United States rule over Florida. But some people who've looked back on it said that it was actually a war against the free blacks rather than the Indians. The free blacks oftentimes settled on Native American lands. They were invited there. And so when the US troops invaded, to fight the Seminoles, they were in fact oftentimes fighting against free blacks. Well, eventually Florida was admitted to the United States as a state in 1845. This was part of a deal where Iowa was also admitted as a free state while Florida was admitted as a slave state. The Seminoles were one of what were considered the five civilized tribes. I've mentioned these before in a previous chapter. These are five Native American tribes living in the southeastern United States who had decided the way to deal with the constant influx of whites and the threat that they posed to the, to the Native tribes was to adopt the ways of the whites, not in totality, but in many ways. Uh, becoming farmers, living in cities, taking up wearing clothes that were more similar to the whites, publishing newspapers, things like that. They believed that by adopting lifestyles similar to the whites, they would not be see seen as a threat and they'd be left alone. Well, nonetheless, they were eventually removed from their native lands. One of the things that instigated this was the discovery of gold on land set aside for the Cherokee tribe, mostly in northern Georgia, but stretching over into some neighboring states too. The discovery of gold on Cherokee lands caused many whites to want an opportunity to get on those lands to mine for the gold. But the problem was is that the Native Americans were in the way. So in 1830, excuse me, 1830, the United States Congress passed a law called the Indian Removal Act, which would allow for these native tribes to be resettled out in the West in territory specifically set aside for Indian tribes in Oklahoma. But not all the tribes wanted to move right away, and they thought that they had a right to these lands that they had agreed to by treaty years before. This question of whether the native tribes could keep their land was in a sense settled by the United States Supreme Court in 1832. This is another item that we've discussed in a previous chapter, and that was that a Christian missionary, Samuel Worcester, went to preach among the um, Cherokees in Northern Georgia. This was actually against Georgia law at the time. White visitors were not supposed to go onto Cherokee land without permission of the government of the state of Georgia. Well, he was caught going onto their land, but the Cherokees argued that he was there by their permission. He had been invited to be there, and they were the ones that controlled the land instead of the state of Georgia. They should decide whether he was able to go in there rather than Georgia. Well, a court case was brought over this question that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and it was decided in Worcester's favor. 
Now, this didn't direct, directly address the question of Indian removal, but it did direct, directly address the question of who controlled this land, and it firmly settled that it should be controlled by the Cherokees. Nonetheless, the United States pressed forward to get the Cherokees off this land. They sent negotiators who eventually signed with some members of the Cherokee tribe the Treaty of New Anchota, in which the tribe was offered $5 million to relocate to Oklahoma. Now, I said that only some of the tribe agreed to the treaty. Those who did not agree to the treaty were then forcibly removed. By this point, Martin Van Buren was president of the United States. Andrew Jackson had originally overseen this idea of Indian removal. Martin Van Buren had been his vice president during his second term, and he pushed forward with it, specifically ordering that the Cherokees be forcibly removed from their native lands, citing the treaty that had been signed with some of them. The Cherokees that were forcibly removed from northern Georgia amounted to 16,000 who were marched all the way to Oklahoma. This forced march was dreadful for them, with about 6,000 of them dying along the way, and the march being given the, the nickname the Trail of Tears. But it wasn't just the civilized tribes of the south that were resettled in the west, in Oklahoma and nearby areas. It was also the Sauk tribe from what would be the Wisconsin Territory. They were led by a chief named Blackhawk. And so the war that was fought between the whites and the Sauk tribe was known as the Blackhawk War. Well, the Sauk tribe was eventually defeated and they were forced to relocate into what today is Kansas. So we had these various tribes from across the south and some from what was known at the time as the, the Midwest or the, excuse me, the Northwest territories who were forcibly settled in Kansas and Oklahoma to get them out of the way of the whites coming in and taking the lands. Well, this reservation system and then the removal system um, very intimately tied the Native American populations with the United States government. And the United States government puzzled over what to do with these Native Americans that they had removed. They were potential antagonists still sitting on the border of the United States. And so there was a thought to make them more American. And a way that this could be done was through a fund created by Congress called the Civilization Fund which was specifically set up to provide money to help the Native Americans to fit in in their new location. And one of the ways this would be done was by providing money to religious schools to open up in Native American territories and teach the children for free and in so doing culturally prepare them to be more American than members of their tribe, whatever it may be. Now, not all tribes surrendered as easily as these other tribes did and were forced out. One of the tribes that held on the longest were the Comanche tribe. The Comanche tribe were known as a horse culture. Now, interestingly, there were no horses in North America before the European settlers came and brought them with them. But some of them escaped. They eventually formed wild herds out on the Great Plains. They were domesticated then by the native tribes who became great horsemen to use them for their own lives. By the time that the white settlers had moved into the area eventually where the Comanche were to try to take those lands to, the Comanche had become expert horsemen and used them for everything that they did in their lives, including fighting against the whites who wanted to come take their land. The Comanches claimed that there was a wide area that they had at least some claim to. Here on this map, there's a small area called the Comancheria, where various Comanche groups primarily lived. But they asserted the right to raid anywhere within the larger area that's pictured here. They asserted that this was part of their lifestyle, to ride into areas on their horses, and take whatever they wanted, including from white settlers. And it would be many years before this behavior was suppressed by the United States of America. 
In this movement to the West, one of the areas that particularly attracted the attention of American settlers was Texas. The history of Texas um, is partially a history of Mexico too, because Texas was originally part of Mexico. In 1821, Mexico won its independence from Spain. And a few years later, a Mexican con constitution was agreed to, which created a federal system in Mexico, meaning that there were various states with at least some independence from each other. Among these states was Texas. But Texas was getting a flood of immigrants from the United States. There were so many coming in that the Mexican government got worried that Texas was becoming more American than Mexican. So the Mexican government passed a series of measures to discourage immigration from the United States into Texas. One of the things they did was they required immigrants to convert to Catholicism. The Catholic religion was the state religion of Texas. They also emancipated slaves in Texas in 1829. Now, these first two things were readily ignored by the Americans who settled in Texas. They didn't convert to Catholicism. They didn't give up their slaves. Well, Mexico tried to increase the taxes on them and eventually in 1830 banned any immigrants coming in from the United States at all. Well, none of this worked. Immigrants from the United States kept moving into Texas. Well, along the way, while this is happening, the government of Mexico changed. A general in the Mexican army named Santa Ana took over the country as a dictator in 1834. In response to this, the Americans living in Texas, who called themselves Texians, protested to the government in Mexico that they should be able to set their own rules within their state instead of following whatever it was that Santa Ana said. And they cited the Mexican Constitution, which set up Texas as its own sort of independent state within the state of Texas. Well, Santa Ana didn't like the idea of Texas, in a sense, declaring its independence. Now, not exactly completely declaring independence, but at least declaring that they had some autonomy against his rule. And the conflict that rose out of them asserting this independence and Santa Ana not accepting it is the Texas Revolution. The beginning of the Texas Revolution went bad for the American settlers in Texas. They had an extended period of many months stretching from 1835 through 1836, where the Mexican army would press farther into Texas, raid small communities, and the people would flee ahead of the Mexican army. This became known as the runaway scrape in Texas history, because there were so many people that barely scraped by getting out of the way before the Mexican army came, showed up. So to begin with, the, the Americans in Texas were being scattered and defeated. One of the most famous of these defeats came at the Siege of the Alamo, a sort of fortress in what would become today the metropolitan area of San Antonio. In 1836, some Americans trying to defend Texas against the Mexican army um, were holed up in the Alamo. The Mexican army laid siege, eventually breached the defenses, and slaughtered hundreds of people on this site. Well, remember the Alamo became a rallying cry for Texans in their battle against the Mexican government and the Mexican army. In 1836, they staged a surprise counterattack. They did so in the Battle of, of San Juancito. They were led by a man named Sam Houston. They were outnumbered, but they staged the surprise attack and they won the battle swiftly. Some historians say that it only lasted 18 minutes before the Texans defeated the Mexican army, which was unprepared for their assault. During the battle, Santa Ana, the dictator of the Mexican government and the leader of the Mexican armies was captured by the Texans. And he was forced 
at the point of a sword to sign a treaty that gave Texas its independence from Mexico. This then led to the creation of the Republic of Texas, an independent country on the border between Mexico and the United States, but populated primarily by immigrants from the United States. Well, the president at the latter period of this time, a man named John Tyler, thought that it would be a very good idea to offer to admit Texas to become a new state of the United States. Now remember, the 13 original colonies became their own little independent countries as a result of the American, uh, excuse me, of the American Revolution. Well, Texas was in a similar position after its revolution against the, the country of Mexico. It became its own little independent country. John Tyler thought they would naturally fit in. They had a problem. He was a president without a party. He had been elected as a member of the Whig Party, but his ideas were more in line with the Democrats. So the Whig Party didn't like him and they got rid of him. But because he was a Whig, the Democratic Party didn't embrace him either. He was called his ascendancy because none of the people who cast votes in the election of 1840 were really wanting him to be president. They voted for William Henry Harrison, but he died shortly after taking office and John Taylor became a president by accident, a president who betrayed in the views of many people his own Whig party by embracing ideals of the Democratic Party. So he was not a popular president with either party. This led, then led in the election of 1844 to neither party nominating for him for president, though he was the sitting president. The Whigs nominated Henry Clay, their longtime leader and multi-time presidential candidate. The Democrats nominated James Polk, a surprise, a governor that kind of came out of nowhere to become the leader of the party, and he won. Now, Texas had been offered to join the Union while John Tyler was still in office, but they didn't agree to it until after um, James Polk became president. Then it was some time before the United States Congress could ratify their admission. So they actually became part of the United States in 1846, though they originally sought to join and were offered the opportunity to join in 1845. After the United States claimed Texas from Mexico, this led to a hostile relationship between the Mexicans and the Americans. This was made worse by a dispute over where the actual border of this new country and eventual state of Texas was to be found. The Texans claimed that the southern border of their territory was the Rio Grande River. The Mexicans did not accept that. They argued that the boundary was a river to the north of it, the Nusas River. Well, James Polk wanted to instigate a provocation with Mexico so that he could send in the military to settle this question of whether this territory would be uh, part of Texas and thus part of the United States of America or whether it would remain with Mexico. So he sent a peace envoy, a, non, a man named John Slidell, to Mexico City in 1845 to try and negotiate the border. Now, this was a hollow gesture. Polk knew it wouldn't work, and it didn't. He also sent General Zachary Taylor, along with a, a group of troops, to in 1846 set up a camp on the border. But what they did was they set up their camp south of the border claimed by Mexico, but still on the north side of where it was claimed by Texas. The Mexican troops couldn't tolerate American soldiers in that area and attacked them in what became known as the Thornton Affair, and 11 U.S. soldiers were killed. This then became the rallying cry that Polk could use to mobilize people for the war, 
and many people believe that he did this on purpose, placing the troops in a position where he knew they would be attacked so he could use that as a pretext to go to war with Mexico. So this was sometimes called Mr. Polk's War, but it was actually a popular war. 50,000 people volunteered to go help fight the Mexicans and get them out of Texas. Quickly, the United States Army defeated the Mexican Army and actually occupied the capital of Mexico, the city of Mexico City. To negotiate an end to this war, the Mexicans agreed to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which for $15 million compensation to them, forced them to give to the United States major chunks of New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, and Arizona, and the entirety would, of what would eventually become the states of Utah, Nevada, and California. Eventually, another strip of land was added to this through a separate purchase, negotiated by a man named Gadsden, and this is called the Gadsden Purchase, which added some more land to the south of the Gila River in New Mexico and Arizona. This then completed the acquisition of these lands in the southwest of the United States from the country of Mexico. This success in sparking a war with Mexico that then led to the grabbing of this extensive land in the south, southwest of what would eventually be the United States inspired many other people to try to instigate other things in the region to try to get other parts to also be join the United States of America. A man named William Walker was a particular instigator of these kind of things, which became known collectively as filibustering. Now, don't confuse this with the kind of filibustering that takes place when someone stands up in the United States Senate and just keeps talking and talking and talking. That is something called filibustering also. That's not what's being talked about here. Instead, what's being talked about here is private citizens trying to instigate some conflict somewhere so that they can slyly grab the land involved in the conflict and then eventually make it part of their own personal kingdom or perhaps the United States of America eventually. People who had this ideal in mind were inspired by what happened in Texas, where immigrants came in, forced the mother country, Mexico, to eventually come into conflict with them and then defeated the mother country and claimed the territory for themselves. One of the people that was particularly inspired by this was a man named William Walker. At different times, he tried to set up his own sort of little kingdom in Baja, California, and in Nicaragua, and eventually he was captured in the state of Honduras and executed. But he was not the only one that went about doing this kind of thing, trying to get in and get a piece of lands that they assumed would one day become part of the United States of America. A last thing that influenced the settlement in the West and truly brought the country all the way across the continent was the gold rush. Several years before, a trail was established across the Western United States from the outpost town of Independence in Missouri all the way to the Oregon Territory. This was a way for American settlers to go to these territories out on the edge of the map where they could get land, like was talked about in the beginning of this lesson with the ideal of the yeoman farmer. Now, with this trail already established across the country, it wasn't that big of a deal to also divert part of these people down into what would become California, but originally was Mexican territory. When the Mexican-American War was fought, some of the people in California that had diverted off in that trail and settled there decided to declare that California was its own independent country too. They did so in 1846 and this declaration of independence only really lasted for less than a month, about 25 days, until a man named John C. Fremont showed up as a representative of the U.S. Army and claimed California for the United States, rather than for the people who had already declared their independence. Once the land was claimed by the United States, then there was a question of getting people to come settle it. 
to make it truly like the rest of the United States. Well, one of the things that inspired settlers to eventually come to California in mass was the discovery of the gold at a place called Sutter's Mill, referring to a mill that would be used to process logs that was near the San Francisco Bay Area. In 1848, some workers there at that mill discovered that there was gold in the river where they were working. This then led to a vast influx of new immigrants who became collectively known as 49ers because they came in in the year 1849 and their primary purpose in coming to California was for, to, for them to hunt for gold that on the off chance they might find it and become rich. These mines that were created as gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill and other places were oftentimes staffed by immigrants. People from Mexico and key people from China were very common. These immigrants provided the backbone of the mining industry in some of these places. Well, eventually California was admitted as a state, fairly quickly actually mostly because of the influx of settlers and the gold rush. The United States Congress wanted to get in on this too, in a sense, and get this new state in where gold had been discovered. Well, California wasn't the only place whose settlement was inspired by the discovery of gold. Across the West, there were many other towns that were settled originally because some sort of precious metals were found there to be mined. Collectively, these are known as gold rush towns, and they had a prominent influence on the formation of the United States, as they gave the Congress reason to admit these states, as more and more people moved into them, even if they were moving in just to find gold. And that completes this lesson for Chapter 12.